virtue itself seems something like the harmonious balance of potentially competing virtues. Maybe virtue itself is the game that virtuous traits play. It's something like that. And then, so you can't reduce it to any one thing. You can't say, well, the most aggressive guy is the best, or the most intelligent guy, or the most cooperative guy, or the best looking guy, or any of that. It's not reducible to a single dimension, no matter what the dimension is. But that doesn't mean that there isn't something that all the virtues point to. And I, I do think, too, that that pleasure that makes itself manifest in mentoring is probably an index of the virtues being balanced properly, right? Because if you're in a mentoring relationship with someone and you're really attempting to operate, let's say, not only in their best interest, but in the best interest of all the people they could serve. So like when I was training graduate students, you know, part of what I'm thinking is, well, if this person is now under my supervision and they're going to become a professor, well, they're going to develop a research enterprise and God only knows where that'll go. Like that can be very influential and they're going to train they're going to have a pretty direct influence on at least thousands of people. And so you can imagine that you're trying to work in that person's best interest, but you're trying to work in the best interests of that person insofar as that person is going to be willing to serve the best interests of all the people that they're going to serve. Yep. Right, right. And that's something that you're going to have to develop the feel for, right, with these individual human beings because they're all a little bit different. So there might be one individual that you have to be a little bit more aggressive oh, to get definitely. them to step up, yeah. and there might be another individual that you have to back off a little bit. Yeah. I've, I've talked about leadership and saying that you get these tools, right? And it's like woodworking. So woodworking, you've got to learn how to operate the tools on wood, right? The saw and the drill and and, and the chisel. You got to learn how to work those tools. But then you got to remember that there's different types of wood. Mm-hmm. And you've got pine, which is very soft, and you've got ipe, which is very hard. And then you've got to learn how to work those yeah. tools on those pieces of wood. And then with human beings as a leader, mm-hmm. you've got to remember that each piece of wood is different. Each piece of pine, yeah. this one has a knot and this one has a, a, a different bend to it. So you've got to really pay attention to balancing out these various tools that you have, because if you go too hard on a piece of pine, you'll destroy it. If you don't go hard enough with a piece of ipe, you yeah. won't make any impact. Yeah. So yeah, what you're talking about, very true. And this is what makes leadership and just human interaction yeah. so difficult because Everyone is a little bit different. Everyone is unique. Yeah. And you still have the same tools. It's not something that I can't train you. Say, well, you know, every piece of wood is different, so you, therefore you just can't, it's just unmanageable. No, here's the tools, and you got to learn the art of working on the hardwood versus the softwood. And it's the same thing with leadership. Like, I can't give you the, oh, here's the answer 100% of the time with all human beings, you do this. Yeah. No, actually, here's the range of tools that you can utilize in those types of situations from a leadership perspective. And you've got to figure out how much pressure to apply, what angle you're going to use, and it's going to be a little bit different. And that's why it takes experience and it takes time. But unfortunately, sometimes people think that leadership is just something that you're born with. Yeah, or it's a set of rules. or Yeah, or it's a set of rules. It's like, this is what you're born with and you have these capabilities and, oh, did you see that guy give that speech and tell everyone what to do? Man, he was awesome. Yeah, I I could never do that. Well, no, actually, you can do that Mm -hmm. and you can learn Mm -hmm. to become more articulate and you can learn how to have a better command presence. Mm -hmm. Are you going to have the same command presence that that charming and charismatic individual had? Maybe not. Maybe you can't get there but you can definitely improve and you can definitely get better. And then you can bring someone on your team that has a huge amount of charisma. And maybe when it's time to get up and and, and shock the troops into action, you let that guy step up because he's better than you. So that's- Well, you see that in the story of Moses, which is a classic leadership story. Moses isn't verbal. And he tells God that when God comes along and says like, well, you're you're gonna stand up against tyranny and you're gonna lead the slaves out of captivity which is what people are always doing in their life if they have any sense. Moses' first objection is, well, you know, the, the tradition has it that he had a speech impediment or something like that. Like, it's actually quite a severe impediment. So he has Aaron, who's his communicator, right? And so, you know, you pointed to something there. People often assume that leadership means charismatic speaking, for example. Well, the kind of public communication leadership that you and I are doing depends on that. But that's by no means the only way of being an effective leader. 
I would, I would say it's probably much more akin to what we've been talking about in terms of play. It's like a good leader is someone that who can continually create games and present them to people that they want to play. And there's lots of ways of doing that. You can do that and be quiet, be quiet. Like I had a, I had a client, a lawyer, he ran a big law firm in Toronto. Um, I worked with lawyers like that for quite a while and they were sent to this little organization I was part of. The value proposition to the law firms was you send me your best people and we'll work to make them 15% more productive, which for those people meant a lot, right? But we work for them, not you. And so then what we were doing with each of these people was radically different. It really depended on the person. And one of the guys that really struck me, he was very, very quiet. And all he did in his office, all he did was go around and listen to people and actually listen. And so he could get wind of interpersonal conflicts of the sort you were describing, you know, the power game conflicts just before they were developing, right? People would tell him what was wrong. And because he was listening, he could fix the things that were wrong with just like a tap and a nudge, right? Because he did it before they got out of control. And it was really interesting to watch him operate because it really looked, even to him, like he was doing very little as the manager of this law firm. But what he was doing was exactly the right amount at exactly the right time. And he was doing that because he was like, and his orientation was true. He wanted the firm to function as well as it possibly could. And that's genuinely what he wanted. And he didn't care whether people, he didn't even care if he knew that what he was doing was effective, <laughs> much less what other, so there's a yeah. gospel statement that's very mysterious. You shouldn't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. It's like, well, what does that mean? It means you shouldn't even be concerned about whether you give yourself credit for what you've accomplished. You know, now there's a boundary on that because credit where credit is due. But if you're undertaking the task just so that you feel better about yourself in your own eyes, you're contaminating the motivation. Yeah. The better motivation is this mentoring motivation. And I think it really is. It's a cause for optimism that that's such a deep source of meaning, you know, because you know as well as I do that there are lots of young people, we'll talk about young men for a moment, who feel lost. Like, where am I going to find the meaning in my life? And if you can let people know that one of the deepest possible sources of meaning that you can tap that's more or less un, it's unfathomable, right? It never stops giving is the meaning that comes as a consequence of working on behalf of the appropriate development of other people. Yeah. Uh, when people come to me and they say, well, I just don't, I don't, I don't know what to do. I don't know what my goals should be. Yeah. I'm just kind of lost. Yeah. I always tell them, go, go, go help other people. Right. Go help other people. Right. Like, you'll find some direction. I don't care if you go down to a soup kitchen or you go to a, a, a boys club where their kids need mentoring or they need someone to teach them how to throw a baseball or whatever the case may be. Whatever you can do, you go and help people yep. and, and you're going you're gonna to find some direction really quickly. Yep. When you realize that you're just a little bit ahead of them in life yep. and you can give them so much and, and that's going to be very powerful. 